My name is uh, Pelham, and if I haven't met you yet, I hope to meet you soon. I'm going to do something that I'm not supposed to do, which is to, uh, to publicly admit that I'm, I'm not going to be home next week. My, my house will be empty. But I'm not worried because I have a guard cat who kind of going to watch over things. And we're going to Florida for a vacation next week. And uh, this is a big, big deal for us. We haven't done a, any sort of family vacation before. And, uh, you know, we never intended to go to Disney World. That was never part of the, the plan. But anyone who has been to Florida with children knows that the, uh, you know, the allure is strong. It's like, well, we're already going to be there. And it's so close. That's how they get you, right? That's how, that's how they get you. The main decision has now become, well, there's a million Disney decisions to be made, but the main one, Animal Kingdom or Magic Kingdom? You know, they have all these different parks. And the, the, the question really comes down to princesses or animals? What are we going to go see? And uh, I have my own opinion. <laughs> what I would like to go see? Animals. I'm trying to make it a family decision. And uh, so we ask our two-year-old, and it's princesses. <laughs> and I'm sort of resigning myself to this, uh, this fact a little bit. It doesn't uh, help the, the fact that you know, we're, we're showing her movies to get ready for this, and Cinderella's sort of been the main one. And you know you walk into Magic Kingdom, and what do you see? It's Cinderella Castle. And uh, so. We're kind of engrossed in the Cinderella story right now. It's a big deal. You know, the story, there's a, uh, there's a kingdom, and there's a king who desperately wants an heir for his son, the prince, and so he, he throws a ball and invites all the eligible young ladies to come to the castle, and uh, including, including one young woman, and, uh, you know, the rest is history. The rest is actually a fairy tale. It's not history. But what I'm telling you uh, now, this parable, is not a fairy tale. It is a parable. And as we've been learning, with you know, five or six weeks at this point, parables are cryptic stories that often have a twist or a punchline at the end. And this one today, the final one, has got quite the punchline. So far, We've looked at seven parables that Jesus uses to describe the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like mustard seeds and yeast that grow. It's like a fishing net that catches everything. It's like hidden treasures, fine pearls, a merciful king, a generous landowner. And you'd think that by the time we come to all of these, we'd really be able to define or explain what the kingdom actually is. But if you're like me, the question still stands. But what is it? I know what it's like, maybe. But what is the kingdom? So we take that mystery and we bring it to the final parable. Matthew 22, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding banquet. It's like a wedding banquet. Jesus talked about banquets and weddings a lot. And there's a reason. It's because there's a background story that all of his listeners, the Jewish people, especially the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests and the elders, they would know the background. They would know why Jesus, Jesus is drawing on this particular image to make a point. And as Graham read a couple minutes ago, this idea of a banquet is a big prophetic hope in the Old Testament. There is this idea that one day, this is Isaiah 25, one day God would become king. God would be enthroned, and a new age is going to begin at some point in history. And when this happens, all the nations will stream together onto a mountain, and they, there they will feast. Choice meat, fine wine, an incredible party. Not just a party for the sake of a good time, but a party where certain things will be no more. No more oppression. No more death. No more tears. No more shame. That's quite the party. 
and he frequently drew on this image. The messianic banquet, the final party at the end of the age when God would be king and all would be made right as the nations come together to worship him. Jesus saw this becoming true in himself. And anyone who knew the scriptures would have understood the references he's making. Now it brings us to the parable. Any good parable is not, we don't do it justice if we just read the parable. We have to understand the context. Who is Jesus talking to and why is he making these statements? Let's just sketch the picture for this final parable. When Jesus is now speaking during Passover, he has just entered the city of Jerusalem in a provocative public stunt that gets everybody's attention, and it's an intense week of political upheaval. Because imagine, this is colonized and oppressed Israel, and they're all streaming together to celebrate a liberation story. Imagine what that feels like to be celebrating your liberation when you're actually oppressed and in many ways enslaved by Rome. The tension is in the air. Where is he speaking this parable? He's speaking it on the mountain, if you understand. He's speaking it in Jerusalem, on, in the temple. It's the religious power center of occupied Israel, the most important place in the land. Who is he speaking to? The religious leaders who are trying to hold on to this power, who are now publicly trying to shame him and kill him. They've already made up their mind. This guy's got to go, especially after what he just did. The chief priests and the elders are the audience, but everybody is listening. It's Passover. They're in the temple. Everyone knows who Jesus is at this point. Here comes the most important people in the city, the chief priests. They confront him. The whole city's listening in. Right before this, Jesus marched into the temple and disrupted it. He overturned the tables, something about a whip, and uh, it was intense. Jesus has become a little bit of a troublemaker. And he has been, just like when he came into Jerusalem, sort of saying, I'm the king. This whole thing about the temple is another way of him asserting royal authority. I'm allowed to do this. And it's very upsetting. Right after this, Jesus has his final meal, and he gives himself over to be executed. You can feel that this parable is sort of a climax of the parables. It's all coming right down to this moment, the last parable Jesus gets to tell before his final days. So let's read it. Open up to Matthew 22. I'm going to need a Bible, too. Buy some time. There you go. Thank you. Matthew 22. Understand the context again. 22. I'm just going to read the first couple of verses. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. It's a nice way to end that section. The invites go out, and the guests refuse to come. What you have to understand about the custom of wedding invitations, especially uh, some like from coming from the king, these invitations had already gone out in one wave. The people would have been uh, advised that they are invited. The wedding is coming. We're just cooking the food now. So you better get yourself ready, and I'll send my servants to let you know when it's all ready to go.
they would have accepted the invitation, but they decided not to show up to the party. Hmm. Hmm. Why does Jesus tell a story like this? This is the story of Israel. This is the whole story of the Old Testament played out again. God, the king, invites Israel to the kingdom, to the party, to his ways of life and liberation. And generation after generation, they turn away from God, and they choose idolatry, they choose injustice. They say, yes, we're in. But when the time comes, they fail to show up. They don't participate in the kingdom. They don't live the way God calls them to. God sends his servants, prophets, again and again, but they're abused and ignored, even killed. And the chief priests, they hear this story, and they've heard it before. Why are you telling us this, Jesus? Well, I think it's helpful to remember that maybe the main reason he tells them this story is not to tell them about ancient Israel. Maybe it's actually the story of Jesus' ministry so far. It means coming out of his lips. Here God comes in the flesh to invite people to the kingdom. He says the kingdom of God is near. Repent, believe the good news, follow me. But in his hometown, Galilee, he's rejected. I know this guy. He's just Joseph's son. They reject him. So he moves on to Jerusalem. Here I am, the king, finally arrived. But they reject him. The story of Jesus' ministry so far. Rejected invitations. Of course, there's some exceptions, and we'll get to those later. But Jesus knows in this moment the leaders are trying to kill him. And he tells the story puts himself in the position of the king or the servant and says, indirectly, I know you're trying to kill me. Imagine speaking to those people in that moment in public. The custom of wedding invitations. When the king invites you, you don't really have an option. It's more of a command. It's an honor-shame culture. You reject an invitation, certainly if you reject an invitation from the king. It's a major insult. If you reject the king's invitation, you're rejecting the king. You're rejecting his reign. You're refusing to be his follower. It's not a neutral act to say, I'm not coming to the king's party. It's actually a violent act of revolution. Certainly, they kill his servants. And then you see this awful sort of a response that we need to think about another time of how the king then responds to the, uh, to the people. It's not, a, it's not a culture where everyone gets to make their own decisions in a vacuum and uh, you just make your own choice and do what's right for you. That's not how that society works. You're invited to the king's banquet. You go to the banquet. And here the chief priests are standing and listening. And how does it sound to them? He's very clearly painting them as being in the wrong, in public. He's very clearly painting them as carrying on the tradition of unfaithful, rebellious Israel, when they're supposed to be the faithful ones, keeping the guard. And he's painting himself as one of God's prophets, sent out to proclaim God's kingdom only to be abused. Faced with this truth, the chief priests are not going to be happy. It's going to make them boil up inside. That leads us to part two of the parable. Let's keep reading. Eight to ten. Then he, the king, said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go now to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled 
with guests. This is where the story goes. This is where the story progresses. The first people, the pre-invited people, they refuse to show up. But suddenly there's a new wave of people invited. Why does Jesus put this spin on the story? Well, again, this is what Jesus has been doing all along. In his three years of ministry, he's rejected in his hometown. He's rejected in the capital. But he invites the sinners and the tax collectors, the poor and the blind and the lame. He says, you're invited to the kingdom. Let me eat with you. Let me drink with you. Follow me. The good and the bad. That's what this parable tells us. The good and the bad. The bad people, the, the morally dubious people, the, the, the traitors, the, the ones whose decisions have hurt the people around them, they've alienated themselves from others, the ones that we would naturally want to judge because we just disapprove of their actions, and perhaps rightly so. Jesus invites them into the banquet. This is what Jesus has been doing all along. This is what's got him in trouble. He knows this. The chief priests have all these accusations against him. And here he's saying, I'm the king or I'm the servant and I've gone out and I have done this and it is good. This invitation, it transcends morality. It's more than just about who's making the right decisions. And it transcends, certainly, religious boundaries. Jesus is telling us it's not our job to determine who enters the kingdom. We just have to sow the seed widely so it falls on the path and in the good soil. We're not, to, we're not supposed to be the ones who draw lines. Whoever comes in, we can be sure it's going to be a mixed bag. That's the point of the other parables he told, the fishing net, where you bring everybody in and God will sort them out. It's a parable of the wheat and the tares. You collect it all and then God will deal with it at that point. That sort of distinction is not ours to make. What we know is that this invitation is an act of sheer grace. The good and the bad invited in. We know the verse up on the screen coming up. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you've been saved. Through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, not by how good you are, so that no one can boast. And this, mercifully, is where we want the parable to stop. Maybe we've heard a story or a parable like this before. In fact, almost exactly when year ago today, March 19th, I stood up here and I preached a sermon about how Jesus was at a dinner party with the Pharisees and there was all these power dynamics and so Jesus told a story about a master who invited people to a banquet and they refused the banquet and so he, he sent people out to the country lanes and he brought in all these people to the banquet and in the end the banquet was full and it was an amazing party. And that's where the parable ended. This is a different parable. There we go, that's a screenshot. That's, that's just one year ago. Here I am. The master wanted his house to be full, and it was. And we just, we love that. Inclusion and welcome. It's a party. Everyone can come. And we just, please, Jesus, stop the teaching right here. This is a different parable. The context is different. Now, the stakes are much higher. He's told these stories before. People know that. But now, Jesus says, it's time for the punchline. He's not just speaking to Pharisees. He's speaking to the chief priests, the highest of the highest, most important people. He's not at a dinner party. He's in a temple surrounded by anxious crowds. He's not just in the middle of his ministry where he's starting to spread the word. Right now, he's in his final week. No more indirect teaching. No more secrets. No more waiting. He's now not afraid of provoking the powers that be. Because the time has come. The kingdom is near. I remember reading this parable for the first time and being shocked at how it ends. 
It was 2013, and the Malagash staff had to uh, read and discuss the Gospel of Matthew in advance of the summer, and we, we all collectively came to Matthew 22, and what happens next? And none of us could make sense of it. Why would Jesus say what he's about to say? Like, how, how could this happen? This just, it doesn't seem characteristic uh, of Jesus or, or God. Uh, it seems unfair. I thought Jesus was all about inclusion. And that's where we come to the last part of the parable. We'll read on. So, verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed the man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked. He calls him friend. How did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of, che- of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Does he have to finish the parable this way? It just makes me cringe. And I think that's the right, that's the response Jesus is going for. It's a punchline. It's a twist. Just when you think you know where this story is going. This is where I want to remind you we're not reading something that's meant to be taken literally every step, every detail. It's a parable. It's a story that Jesus is trying to tell to make a point. It's a riddle that has intentional twists to provoke a response into you and to get you to examine what you think you know. It would be unwise if we were to take every detail of this story and map it onto our theology of God and the elect and heaven and hell. And I don't think Jesus wants us to take this story and just to make a big point out of every little detail. It's a riddle story in a wisdom tradition. Can we say that in some ways God is like the king who indiscriminately invites everyone into the party and then throws someone out because of their clothes? Yes. In some ways, God is like that. Can we say God is exactly like that king in every way? No. Can we say that the kingdom of heaven is exactly like this story? No. But can we say that the kingdom of heaven, in some ways, is like this? Apparently, we can. What we need to do now, figure out the point that Jesus is trying to make, by adding on what almost feels like a second level or a second parable altogether. First, a note about wedding clothes. I normally don't dress up this formally, but today I'm wearing my wedding tie, my wedding shirt, and my wedding pants. And even the customary um, ridiculous wedding uh, Socks. In that day and age, the whole custom around wedding clothes, it's, it's completely different. You don't need to go rent a tux or pay $2,000 for your nice summer wedding gown. Wedding clothes are accessible. Everybody has them. Because there's a lot of weddings. Every weekend. You bring out your wedding clothes and you go to the party. Everyone would own wedding clothes. I mean, it seems ridiculous that the servants go out, this last-minute invitation, okay, the good and the bad, come into the party, and then someone shows up. It's like, well, you didn't give him any time to get dressed. Like, you didn't get to plan this out. He gave him all the time he needed. The man owns wedding clothes. He just chose not to wear them. And the man's response when he's confronted, he says nothing. He's not like, oh, listen, I have a great excuse My clothes are at the dry cleaners. I didn't have the money today. I didn't think the colors would go well with the party. Man says nothing. No excuses. He knows what he's done wrong. He owns clothes. He just didn't wear them. 
he betrays his insolence. The king decides to throw the man out of the party. It's not arbitrary. It's not shallow, even though it kind of seems like that. It's because this man was showing disrespect and disdain, not only to the king, but to the whole party. He's showing that he doesn't care. He doesn't really care about the party or the king. He owns clothes. He just decided not to put them on. Let me be clear. I personally don't think that this parable is telling us that God is the kind of God who would throw you out of a party because of your clothes. I don't think it's making comments about clothing. And this is probably fairly obvious to most of us. But I say this because I, I, I was reading commentaries that suggesting this is about the clothes we show up to church in. And the ways that we present ourselves. And we want to we be respectable and show God uh, the proper honor when we walk into a house of worship. You know, I, I get these points, but I just don't think that's the point that Jesus is trying to make. The point I think and Jesus is making is this. If you refuse to put on clothes, if you refuse to put on the right party clothes, you don't want to stay at the party. The kingdom of heaven is like a wedding banquet. And in God's kingdom, love and mercy and justice and holiness reign unhindered. That's what the party is for. It's for love and justice, and holiness, and truth, and mercy. That's what the party is like. That's what makes it a party. That's what Isaiah 25 was all about. One day, God will be king. All the nations will come together on the mountain, and there'll be no more death or oppression, no more shame, no more tears. And if you're showing up to that party, and you're still wearing clothes, of injustice and oppression and death and tears. You don't really want to stay at the party. If someone comes to this party and they want nothing to do with actually living it out, then they are rejecting the party and the king and the kingdom. If you don't wear the right clothes, if you don't actually decide to participate in God's justice for the world, you don't really want to stay at the party and that's what you'll get. You'll get what you want. You won't really get to enjoy it. It's a shame. But God will not let the things that bring death into his kingdom of life. We can't be part of the kingdom if we decide that we want to be the king or the queen. If we're going to the king's party, then we go because he's the king and not us. And let me just pause and tell you how this parable is hitting me personally, because this is meant to, to sting a little bit. I'm really good at presenting myself well publicly. Here I'm all dressed up. My wife says one of my greatest skills is sounding like I know what I'm talking about. But on the inside, I constantly feel like I just don't have my act together. And by that, you know, I, it's very easy for me to notice unhealthy patterns in myself to keep me from loving people, um, keep me from engaging people, keep me from being my best. And God, you know, he subtly, sometimes not so subtly, points these things out to me. He says, you know, you really should change. You have... And when he does that, I usually don't. I usually don't change. I find change really hard, particularly if it's, you know, character work and the deep stuff of the soul where God wants me to let go of destructive things and hold on to things that bring life, to act in humility and servitude and sacrifice. And Maybe I, you're not surprised that I find this hard. And I don't think God is saying, get your act together, or I'm going to kick you out of the party. Like I, that's not the message I, I get from God. I think God is, is grieved when I choose not to fully experience the goodness of his kingdom. When I'm not fully living out of his grace. God is tender, but he's direct with me. And the words of Jesus 
ring in my ears. He says, the kingdom of God is near. That's great. The party has started. So, therefore, repent. Believe. The good news. The good news for the good and the bad, for the poor and the blind and the lame and the morally dubious and the tax collectors and the sinners, all welcomed into the party. It's good news. But it doesn't always sound like good news to the people who feel like they're already in the party or wearing the wrong clothes. Remember where Jesus is. He's in the temple. He's having a public confrontation with the chief priests. This is the third in a series of parables, and the accusation just gets clearer and clearer. He's saying to the people in charge, they have been engaging in injustice. The leaders have been oppressing the people, and they have been rejecting God's own son. And they're resorting to murderous plots. They want to kill him. Jesus knows it. They've chosen not to stay at the party. And they justify their actions, the priests do, because they think they are protecting their own vision of the kingdom. They think they're doing what's right. They're protecting rules-based systems of righteousness. They're protecting the idea that might makes right. You've got to be aligned with the people in power. They're all about maintaining the status quo, keep the temple system going, continue to rip the people off with the money because it's all going to God anyway. But in fact, they're now aligned with a different kingdom. They are no longer aligned with the kingdom of God. They're aligned with a worldly kingdom and a spiritual evil one. And today we have our own visions of the kingdom that we try to protect. Today, we want to hear that everyone, including us, we are okay. That we're all right, exactly as we are. See, God loves us as we are, and we don't need to change. God doesn't need us to change for us to love us. It's true. That's not actually the full picture of what God is like. It certainly isn't what Jesus is like. Unconditional love and acceptance of the people, but not of what they do. When he encountered tax collectors like Levi and Zacchaeus, and when he encountered people caught in adultery, he offered them unconditional love. He welcomed them into the family, but he didn't tell them that they were all right exactly as they were. His love reached them where they were, but he didn't want to let them stay there. When you love someone, you want what's best for them. We're God's beloved. He wants what's best for us. He wants us to be healed and changed and transformed. And it's going to be really hard. But so many people, because they encountered Jesus, they decided that they were going to start walking in his way. They were going to follow the teachings on the Sermon on the Mount. Love your neighbor. Pray for those who persecute you. Give away your possessions. Live a new kind of life. The kingdom, it's open to all, but it requires a response. The invitation requires you to get changed. Put on the clothes. And we're invited to attend the party of justice and love and mercy, but if we want to attend, we have to also act lovingly and justly and mercifully. We're called to help keep the party going. Don't just be a passive recipient. Don't just drink the wine and the food and do nothing to contribute to it. Instead of submitting to God's plans for the party and for our life, we often come to God on our own terms. Sometimes it simply means that we refuse to get changed. Or we only change in the way that we want. We think, it's no big deal. God's going to love me. God's going to forgive me. But to God, liberating people, freeing people, inner healing, that is a big deal to God. And he's grieved when we choose not to participate in it. We come to God because of all he can give us, but we refuse to let him change us. We think only of what God can do for us, and we neglect and we ignore When Jesus says, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. In the junior high Sunday school class right now, we're in the middle of a 10-week series where we look at the top 10 most Googled Bible verses. What are people out there searching for when they look up a Bible verse? And one week by week, we're looking at these verses and examining them in context or whatever. 
And what's interesting, you take a step back and you look at these 10 verses, like what are the verses people are searching for on the internet? You're going to notice some common themes. What are people looking to God for? What are people looking to the Bible for? The main message seems to be something like this. God's going to provide for you. He's going to give you strength. He'll help you do anything you want. He will guard you. He'll shepherd you. He'll prosper you. He's going to make it all work out. These are the Bible verses taken out of context. When put together, create a theology of what God can do for us. These are, are amazing truths, and they're comforting, but they're not the whole picture. Why are people not looking up Bible verses about picking up our cross? And why are people not looking up about loving your enemies? We're more interested in what God can do for us than in about actually doing something ourselves. But sometimes the clothes that we put on, we do put on new clothes, but they're still not the right clothes. Sometimes God, sometimes, you know, we're lazy or something, and, and we choose not to act justly and, and righteously, and sometimes we, we put on the clothes of self-righteousness. We don't accept the gift of grace, and we decide that we're going to try to impress people by putting on clothes that make us look good. We lean too hard on our own efforts. We try to earn a place in the kingdom through good works, whatever it is, this mindset. We need to do more. We need to try harder, be better people. We put on the clothes that we think are appropriate, but they're still not the clothes that are fit for the kingdom. Grace is a gift. Grace is a gift. It's a gift given to us, but it's also a responsibility. So when we are recipients of God's grace, the moment is ours. The ball's in our court. We need to now live as people of grace. Are we going to allow ourselves to be transformed? Are we going to let the little mustard seed or the yeast of the kingdom in our hearts, are we going to let that actually grow? Are we going to turn into a merciful king? Are we going to become the generous landowner in the parables? Will we let it make its way into our hearts and change us? Will we sell everything we have to get that hidden treasure that we know is in the field or to find that pearl of great price? Are we willing to make the changes? It's got heavy. The parable turned heavy. The application turns a little heavy. But I don't want us to feel it as heavy. It's a party. The burden is light. There's life and freedom to be found here. The New Testament takes this imagery of clothes, wedding clothes, and it describes the clothes we need to wear. It describes the middle road, not the, not the road of uh, destruction and just allowing uh, God's love and acceptance to be all that we uh, embrace without actually changing our lives, not that road, not the road of self-righteousness where we try to be the best people that we can so that God will finally accept us. The middle road is found in the symbolism of clothes in the rest of the New Testament. Put on Jesus like he's a set of clothing. Jesus is the close. In Romans and Galatians, it says, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't put on self-righteousness. Throw away your destructive patterns. Put on Jesus. Make his identity your identity. Link your life to him in faith. Let your story, as messed up as it is, whether you're on this road or that road, let that story be absorbed into his way of justice and mercy and renewal. God gives us grace. He gives us a new identity. And he says, become part of my new family. Become a brother and a sister. And when we're given a new identity, it's meant to drive our behavior. It's meant to affect the way that we live and change. I read you Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. 10 minutes ago. It's all about grace. It's so that we can't boast. The very next verse says, Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You put on Jesus, a new identity, and it drives your behavior, good works. It even specifically says in Revelation, when there's a picture of a wedding banquet and all the nations come together fine linen, fine clothes, they stand for the righteous acts of God's holy people. 
And when we put on Jesus-like clothes, it doesn't just mean that we have a new belief system or that we are thinking in a different way. It means that we, we are now actually living in that new way too. You see yourself as part of what Jesus is doing on earth and you can't help but participate in it. If I'm part of the body of Christ, I will do as Christ does. This is not a heavy burden placed on us. It's a gift because it's the way that leads to life. The hard work has already been done. We are not to live in fear of failure or rejection because we are called to put on Christ because he put on us. Jesus put on the appearance and the life of a sinner. The parable of the wedding banquet ends with a man who's wearing the wrong clothes. He looks like he doesn't belong. And he's tied up. He's thrown out of the party into darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus knows that in many ways we make the same choices. That we'll be thrown out of the party. So Jesus gets thrown out of his own party. He puts on the clothes of a sinner. He weeps. He's cast out into utter darkness. He's alone. He is the guest thrown out of the party. And he does it so that we could be made new. So we could put on him instead. So we could be invited in. He became that guest. And Jesus is standing in the temple, confronting the chief priests. And they think that he's saying, they're going to get thrown out of the party. And maybe he's saying that. But what they don't know is that he's saying, I will also be thrown out of the party for you. He knows where it's headed. He knows that to bring the kingdom of heaven, the king is going to have to die. We've looked at all these kingdom parables now. This is it. That's done. One by one. Maybe now everything is crystal clear for you. Or maybe you're like me and you still find yourself asking, I know what the kingdom is like, but what is it? What is the kingdom? We could spend a lifetime defining it. But I found, actually, what I consider to be a really good definition. I take it from the Bible Project. Uh, I'll put it up on the screen. And I've tweaked it a bit. And when I feel despair for the world, or when I feel hopeless in my faith, when I feel like I'm not doing enough, when I'm trying to act self-righteously and I keep failing, or when I feel like I, I, I'm having a hard time changing and I'm not able to get rid of these destructive patterns, focusing on the kingdom, not just on myself, it helps me, it gives me life, purpose, hope. The, a great definition of the kingdom I want us to take with us today. The kingdom is God's rescue operation for the world. It's bringing about a new reality through King Jesus. Evil is confronted, and new creation begins to bloom. God's reign is restored over the world by the creation of a new family of people who will live under his rule by following the way of Jesus. For me, I just want to sit and take that in. That's the kingdom. That's the invitation. Evil confronted. A new family. A new reality a new creation. Maybe there's a phrase in there you want to just tuck away in your heart and whisper to yourself. Make it a prayer as you go into Holy Week next week. We started off the whole Kingdom of Heaven is Like series with the Lord's Prayer. That's what Paul led us in to start his first sermon. I think it's a fitting bookend for us. The center of the prayer, your will be done, your kingdom come. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.